Take a moment and imagine yourself in nature. Where did you picture yourself? In a forest? On a trail? Or maybe on top of a mountain? But did any of you imagine yourself in the ocean, snorkeling and diving on a coral reef? Because if you Google the word nature, of the first 200 images that show up, only six show anything remotely related to the ocean. And of those, only one shows anything under the waves. This is despite the fact that the ocean is by far the largest expanse of nature on our planet, covering 71% of the globe. But our experience with the ocean is often limited to trips to aquariums, the beach, books, and motion pictures. Jacques Cousteau taught us to be amazed by its wondrous creatures. And we all know Jaws that made us afraid to even go swimming in the ocean. I was a little bit of both. I grew up always being fascinated by ocean creatures, but I was also afraid of the unknown and what I couldn't see beneath me. So to conquer this fear, in my early 20s, I strapped an aluminum tank to my back and learned to scuba dive. Over time, fear slowly faded, which gave room for me to be curious about what I was seeing all around me, instead of constantly checking my back for sharks that generally weren't there. Fifteen years later, I now have a career as a coral restoration biologist and underwater photographer. When, you, when having this career has allowed me to have conversations with many different people about my favorite marine organisms. And I remember one such conversation where someone asked, so what are corals anyways? Aren't they just slimy rocks? Well, I could understand his mistaken assumption because unlike pandas and elephants, corals don't have a face. They don't show emotions. It's difficult for people to connect to a creature that has no eyes, no nose, is covered in tentacles, and has thousands of little mouths to our measly one. So to bridge this gap, I turned to photography, as visual imagery is one of the strongest tools we have for how we perceive the world around us. I started taking portraits of coral, photographing them against a solid black background where all of the distractions are removed and you're left with the detail of the coral itself. Some of these images were photographed in the ocean, while others are photographed in a land-based coral restoration nursery where I've built this small studio. I aim my camera at what I believe to be one of the most misunderstood creatures on the planet. So, corals are not slimy rocks. They are animals, but you might be looking at this image and think, well, I don't really see an animal there. But if you look a little bit closer, it's that little jellyfish looking thing. You can see the mouth in the center surrounded by a ring of tentacles. This is called a coral polyp. You're gonna hear me say that word a lot tonight. Zooming back out, we can see that this coral is covered in polyps. Each one is a clone of the one next to it. Think of it like having hundreds of yourself stuck together at the hip, but work, working and functioning as a single unit. These polyps can come in all shapes and sizes, with some being as large as four to five inches, and others as small as just a few millimeters. But in addition to their variety of shape and size, they can also have many different colors. This coloration comes from a single-celled algae that actually lives within the coral's tissue and photosynthesizes, just like the plants and trees in our backyard. This is actually how the coral gets most of its nutrition through this process. But just as the largest trees in the world start from a tiny little seed, all corals start from a single polyp. But eventually, that polyp will begin to divide and duplicate itself through a process called budding. Finally, they'll split into two, and you now have two genetically identical polyps right next to each other. And now you have what's called a coral colony. But this process is incredibly slow, as most corals only grow a few centimeters per year, and at fastest, maybe six to eight inches. One of these slow-growing species is the mountainous star coral, which only grows about two centimeters per year. 
This fragment right here is only about the size of a quarter, but they're capable of growing to the sizes of a small car, if not larger. At these growth rates, that means that some of the oldest individuals of this species in the Virgin Islands were growing and alive when the Virgin Islands was still a Danish colony over a hundred years ago. These large species act as a barrier and rise up to the surface and break waves that threaten our coastal community. So while we take refuge and shelters and concrete houses, an army of tiny little polyps is our first line of defense against one of the most powerful and destructive natural disasters on the planet. On the other end of the spectrum is the Caribbean's fastest growing coral, the staghorn coral. But at just a few weeks old, this single polyp is about the size of a tip of a pen. A few months later, it puts up its very first branch. You can actually see at the tip of this branch where a new tiny little polyps are starting to form. A few weeks later, it puts up a few more branches. And over time, in many years, you'll get what's called a coral thicket. These staghorn thickets are absolutely essential habitats for many of the important ecologically as well as economically important fish that we rely on. But there's only so much space on the ocean floor. And it's normal for corals to occasionally grow into each other. When they do, sometimes they have a little shoving match here in slow motion where one coral tries to grow over top of the other. But just as other animals compete for resources, some corals are not shy to wage war on their neighbors. What looks like a normal polyp here, just going about its polypy business, has a secret weapon. Sweeper tentacles, or as a previous supervisor of mine likes to call them, a coral's weapon of mass destruction. These freakishly long tentacles reach out much further than their normal tentacles and are armed with potent stinging cells ready to attack a coral that grows too close. And as a last resort, corals are capable of taking their insides, expelling their guts through their mouth, placing them on the neighboring coral and digesting that coral's tissue. This is crazy. Whenever I see this, it kind of reminds me of Spider-Man, like casting his web onto one of his enemies. The only difference is that Spider-Man's not really known for digesting his enemies with his web. So all of the corals I've shown you this far are called stony corals. We call them this because they build a hard skeleton out of calcium carbonate, which builds the vertical structure in a coral reef. This is also probably why people sometimes mistake corals for, you know, slimy rocks. But there's so much more. Because if you've ever been snorkeling on a Caribbean coral reef, you've probably seen one of these. What you might have mistaken for a marine plant is actually a type of coral called a gorgonian. But when we look closer, we can see each of its branches comes alive as they're covered with hundreds or thousands of tiny little polyps. And as it sways back and forth, these little polyps are grabbing little phytoplankton and zooplankton in the water column to feed. But the last coral I want to show you today is my personal favorite, which is the pillar coral. Before I even knew what a coral was, I just remember diving on reefs, seeing these, and thinking they looked like some 1960s shag carpet. They have an unmistakable growth form as each pillar rises like a skyscraper in a city skyline. Now, earlier we talked about how corals can reproduce by cloning themselves and budding and creating more polyps, but they can also do it the old-fashioned way. Every year in August, a few days after the full moon, a few hours after sunset, pillar corals get in the mood. One of these is going to send out sperm while the other one sends out eggs. And if they're lucky, they'll meet in the water column and fertilize, thus creating the next generation of pillar coral offspring. Unfortunately, due to pillar coral die-offs, living colonies are now spaced too far apart on a reef for this process to happen naturally. 
but advances in coral restoration techniques have now allowed biologists to collect sperm and egg from wild colonies, bring it into a laboratory, fertilize it, and then later outplant them back on the reef. What you're seeing here is one of the first ever, ever successful attempts at fertilizing pillar coral spawn in 2016. This polyp is so tiny, you can see that the single-celled algae is just now starting to colonize the tissue. A few weeks later, it turned a vibrant green. We had no idea it would do this, since as you could tell by the earlier pictures, it's generally a tannish, orangish kind of color. Today, there are now many universities, institutions, and laboratories that are advancing these techniques to create the next generation of coral offspring. So now that you've had a brief introduction to what a coral is, why does any of this matter? Well, with the exception of the Gorgonian, all of the species that I showed you today have one thing in common. They've all suffered mass die-offs on Caribbean coral reefs, with some of them now listed as threatened, endangered, or critically endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Deadly coral diseases have caused the tissue to literally flake away of many species, leaving nothing but the skeleton. Abnormally warm sea surface temperatures stresses out the coral to the point where they have to expel their symbiotic algae they rely on for nutrition. In 2019, the Virgin Islands actually experienced a mass coral bleaching event. This is in Brewer's Bay. What might look like snow on a coral reef is actually the site of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or if not millions of, of coral polyps slowly starving to death. A few months later, some of that coral did, reco did recover, but much of it did not. Some of these large colonies you are seeing here covered in algae were likely well over 100 years old. The positive news is that conservation is a growing field, and there are success stories to talk about. The brown pelican, a bird that is so common nowadays we barely take a moment to look at it, was actually once on the endangered species list. But thanks to intensive conservation efforts, they've now recovered and are plentiful. The problem is that these conservation efforts disproportionately favor these charismatic megafauna over invertebrates, like coral. A 2020 study found that vertebrates receive six times higher funding than invertebrates. A similar study equated this to the fact that we want to save creatures that are large and furry over creatures that we find ugly or unattractive, despite their ecological and economical importance. So we need to look at coral from a new lens, one that sees them equally as important as pandas and elephants. Coral researchers are developing the tools that it takes to give us a possibility of saving our coral reefs. But this is only half of the battle. The other half comes from the choices that you and I make every single day to live a more sustainable future for ourselves, for our planet, and so we can keep enjoying the spectacular and secret lives, or maybe not so any more secret lives, of coral. So the next time you are diving or snorkeling on a coral reef, slow down and smell the polyps. Thank you. <laughs>